Sigma Tiger News off in your grill with the hottest, juiciest beef online. What do we got today? A Jersey Shore reboot? How about migrants are bad and the white George Floyd? <laughs> There you go. What do we got today? Uh, Jersey Shore reboot? Kind of. Local Jersey Shore leaders respond to reported civil unrest over Memorial Day weekend. Blame unruly, undisciplined, unparented children. Hmm, interesting. Wildwood and Ocean City experienced a rough weekend after incidents caused panic and disrupted an otherwise picture-perfect start to a tourism season. Yeah, so here's what you would expect to see if you head down to the Jersey Shore boardwalk. You know, a bunch of people just enjoying a nice, beautiful day. Well, two Jersey Shore towns had a rough weekend after incidents caused panic in both Wildwood and Ocean City, New Jersey, disrupting what began as a picture-perfect start to an unofficial beginning of summer tourism season. Wildwood police rescinded a state of emergency early Monday. In a joint statement, city leaders said police began to respond to an irrepressible number of calls for service Saturday night. Most of these calls were related to extremely large number of young adults and juveniles that were in the city for Memorial Day weekend. At the peak of this civil unrest, mutual aid requests were sent out to multiple agencies in Cape May County. Officials said the high volume of calls prevented police from responding to certain calls for service, ultimately prompting the state of emergency. The measure was lifted around 6 a.m. No injuries were reported, and officials have not said if any arrests were made. Wildwood will not tolerate unruly, undisciplined, unparented children, nor will we stand by while the laws of the state tie the hands of the police. We wholeheartedly support the city of Wildwood Police Department in protecting this community from these nuisance crowds on our boardwalk and in the city. In Ocean City, officials reported a stabbing on the boardwalk Saturday night. Our officers made multiple arrests last Saturday night and were able to quickly restore order to the boardwalk once the teens involved in the incidents were removed. Mayor Jay Gillian said in a statement to the town's website, We have a highly qualified team of officers on the boardwalk and throughout town, and they will enforce all laws to the fullest. Congratulations. Well done. So let's have a look exactly what was going on there. Boom. All right. panic as you see there on a packed jersey shore boardwalk over the weekend detectives say someone claimed that there was a gun and a possible shooting in seaside heights on saturday that was enough to send a crowd scrambling police say it was just a bunch of unruly kids causing a disturbance that was just one of several incidents over the weekend overnight in south jersey wildwood police declared a state of emergency and shut down the boardwalk because what they described as civil unrest that has since been lifted there was also a boardwalk brawl over the weekend in, of all places, Ocean City, New Jersey, that turned into a stabbing over the holiday weekend. Some people on the shore hope the troubles this weekend are not a sign of what lies ahead. Certainly in Ocean City, it's known as a family destination. Brianna Gallagher from our sister station. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so you can see there, obviously, there's a problem going on with these unruly kids. Where's their parents? Where's the discipline? Were they raised in a daycare? Likely. Do they have fathers? Probably not. All right, Richard Dreyfus slammed for alleged sexist and homophobic comments at Jaw screening. So he's based Massachusetts theater that hosted the actor has apologized for his remarks, writing in a statement, we deeply regret the distress that this has caused to many of our patrons. Don't hold us accountable for somebody else. Massachusetts theater is apologizing to his patrons who came to attend a screening of Jaws, 1980s movie. Well, I don't know why they're doing that. Why they think this was a good idea. Well, Richard Dreyfus, uh, a star in the movie, uh, subjected everyone to alleged sexist and homophobic comments over Memorial Day weekend. Attendees who headed Saturday to the Cabot Theater in Beverly, Massachusetts, for what was billed as an evening with Richard Dreyfus plus Jaws screening, were likely anticipating some amusing or insightful anecdotes from the actor about filming the classic Steven Spielberg action blockbuster. Instead, the Oscar winner went on a free-form rant that according to social media post from those in attendance began while he was speaking about Barbara Streisand and moved into his bigoted perspective on trans youth, the Academy Awards inclusion rules, and then onto trans kids affirming their gender. So, 
an outspoken individual. You know, he's opposite of what's currently being pushed by the liberals. And, uh, you know, he's sick of it. So, in a brief video posted on YouTube, he's shown taking the stage for a Q&A wearing a dress over his clothes. After doing a brief dance, he's helped out of the dress by two people and puts on a jacket. The song playing in the video as he takes the stage is Taylor Swift's Love Story. In another video from the end of the Q&A, Dreyfus speaks about his 2022 book, One Thought Scares Me. We teach our children what we wish them to know. We don't teach our children what we don't wish them to know. It's about the fact that 50 years ago, without telling anybody, they took civics out of the curriculum of all public schools in America, which means we have no knowledge of who the hell we are. And if we don't get it back soon, we're all going to die. Make sure your kids are not the last generation of Americans and you know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, let's go ahead and uh, just have a look and see exactly what was going on there. I mean, to me, it sounds like an overwhelming level of support for uh, Dick Dreyfus there. I don't know, but uh, we stand with you, Dick. All right, Vatican issue statement apologizing for Pope Francis using a homophobic term, but didn't he just say that all these people are accepted into the church no matter who, what, when, where, why, and how? Well, the Vatican used the word homophobic and LGBT activist term used to smear people who oppose homosexuality. To describe crude remarks, Pope Francis reportedly said about homosexuals in seminaries. Yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah, they use the word phobic, Islamophobic, and homophobic, transphobic. Uh, pho phobia is like a fear of something. Uh, these people aren't afraid of it. They just don't like it. They disagree with it. So it's it definitely is a slur, a label applied to people to get them to think twice about their words. But guess what? People don't care. People aren't afraid anymore. Call me a racist. Call me a bigot. It doesn't matter what you say because your opinion doesn't matter because you are a beta, okay? And alphas don't care what beta say. The Vatican issued an apology for Pope Francis reportedly using the word faggotry when referring to homosexual men in the church and said the vulgarism was homophobic. All right, well, the statement issued to journalists by the director of the Holy See Press Office on May 28th reads, Pope Francis is aware of the articles that came out recently about a conversation behind closed doors with the bishops of CEI, Italian Episcopal Conference. As he said on several occasions, in the church there is room for everyone, for everyone. No one is useless, no one is superfluous. There is room for everyone, just as we are everyone, which is totally incorrect. It goes against the, the word of God. You are welcome if you are going to cease your sinful behavior, then you're more than welcome. But as our Father up in heaven, he will uh, turn his back on you if you go against him and his word. And that's how it should work with a family. If your daughter is going to join OnlyFans, you shouldn't support her and clap her on as a, uh, as a entrepreneurial femme. What you should do is turn your back on her and say, what you're doing is disgusting and immoral, and I do not support this behavior. The Pope never intended to offend or express himself in a homophobic terms as he extends his apologies to those who felt offended by the use of the term reported by others. Yeah, well, I mean, the term is pretty hardcore. Let's put it that way. All right, what do we got here? Target? Inside the most dangerous Target store in America? Well, let's, get a, let's have a look at this. Why is anybody worried about going to Target? It's just a store. Well, let's find out. Retail locations in all of America. You probably have one in your hometown, but I assure you that your Target doesn't look like the Target in downtown San Francisco. My God. Check this out. That guy just got caught by armed security. Looks like special forces attempting to shoplift. Does your Target have to lock up in plastic boxes literally every item? This is just like a supplement. These face masks are locked up. Is what a zero trust society looks like. Zero trust society. Every piece of clothing has an alarm on. All of it is tagged. Every dress shirt, tag alarm. Every single pair of shoes. 
Men's underwear? Behind plastic. Uh, no test driving these bikes. Get ready, America. Coming to a target near you. Target is one of the most popular. Yeah, so there you have it, people. Coming to a target near you. The uh, No one trusts society. So what's going on in San Francisco? The most liberal city on earth has fallen. All right, moving right along. Migrant gets arrested for the 10th time in 10 months. What the heck? What's going on here, Joe Biden? Well, here's an image of the individual, Carlos Mavares Villoria. Uh, Carlos, a resident of the Standard Club Migrant Shelter in downtown Chicago, has been arrested 10 times since arriving in our fair city last summer, according to police and court records. Valoria was consistently released from custody after each arrest, but that ended with the 10th case, his first felony, and he is currently living in the Cook County Jail, where he belongs. What's going on here? Is this story just going to like... All right, here we go. His first arrest came July 12th when he was accused of stealing 10 Major League Baseball hats, watches, a backpack, and food worth a total of $193 from Walmart and Evergreen. Judge issued a warrant for his west arrest, sorry, and he failed to appear in court the next month. But he wasn't on the lam for long. The following day, Chicago police arrested him after security at Macy's 111th South State claimed he attempted to shoplift $158 worth of t-shirts. The following month, he was detained for allegedly possessing a crack pipe in the loop. Prosecutors dropped the charge, but a judge ordered officials to destroy the crack pipe. Yeah, definitely a good idea. Uh, he received seven days for the Walmart case, but prosecutors dropped the other two matters. Yeah, man, we're overcrowded. It's not a big deal. He probably won't do it again. November 24th, though, he was arrested for shoplifting and narcotics possession at Nordstrom Rack. 24 North State prosecutors dropped those charges less than three weeks later. What? In February, police arrested him twice, the first time for allegedly shoplifting at Walmart and Evergreen Park. He never showed up in court, and a warrant has been out for his arrest since May 3rd, according to court records. Later that month, Chicago police arrested Valoria after a convenience store clerk in the loop reported that he pulled a gun on him and said something like, I will shoot you. Officers found Valoria inside a different 7-Eleven with a gun-shaped cigarette lighter. According to a CPD report, prosecutors dropped the case less than a month later. Yeah, well, you know, he's, you know he hasn't been charged with anything. You know, he's not really a criminal. After, on April 12th, Chicago police officers tased Valoria after he allegedly ran from them twice and resisted arrest when they tried to detain him for stealing 23.5 ounce four loco from a downtown convenience store. The case is still pending. His eighth arrest came on April 19th when a security guard told him he was not allowed inside Walgreens to North State and he entered anyway. CPD report said prosecutors dropped the case on May 14th. Yeah, yeah, these are all misdemeanors. There's no point to prosecute this. Oh, he's been arrested Eight times in less than a year. Come on. Arrest number nine, that was April 27th at Pritzker Park. The police said he was selling men's clothes without a permit. <laughs> Not that big of a deal. I bought the clothes from another person, and I'm selling it to make money for my kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're a good dad. That brings us to arrest number 10. It happened on May 15th at Pritzker Park. Cook County Sheriff's deputies arrested him for several shoplifting cases, followed by TJ Maxx. 11th North State, according to court records. Valoria pushed, struggled, and fell to the ground with one of the deputies. A second deputy suffered a hand and arm injuries, the report said. In addition to the felony aggravated battery of a police officer, Valoria was charged with resisting reckless conduct and shoplifting merchandise worth $450 from TJ Maxx, including men's clothing and a suitcase. According to court filings, the alleged thefts occurred April 9th, April 25th, April 30th, and May 7th. Judge Ankur Srivastava issued a ruling allowing Valoria's release under electronic monitoring. So far, though, this has not happened. In other new neighbor developments, Giovanni Tovar, 44-year-old Venezuelan living in the Standard Club shelter, faces felony criminal damage charges after he allegedly threw an object and shattered the window of a Chicago, Chicago sorry, police squad car posted outside the shelter on May 19th. Pedro Izquel Omana, a 37-year-old Standard Club resident, is charged with operating and continuing financial crimes enterprises for allegedly shoplifting from three stores in Orland Park on May 11th. So the liberals are going to come out, the Dems are going to come out and say, oh yeah, crime is so down. Oh yeah, it's down. Yeah, because they're not prosecuting any of these people. Come on. What a joke. And how big of a joke is it? Well, guess what? The Venezuelans know exactly how big of a joke it is because they're doing whatever they want. Check it out. Law enforcement in Baton Rouge uncovering an alleged human trafficking operation across multiple states. A federal complaint filed in the Middle District of Louisiana alleges a Venezuelan criminal organization organized this operation. Documents say Baton Rouge deputies found two victims and a suspect located inside an apartment complex. They believe the suspect was a trafficker and a bookkeeper for the alleged gang. According to court documents, one woman says she was first smuggled across the southern border into Texas. She was told she would have to pay the smuggler $30,000.
by having sex with clients of the gang. Oftentimes we'll see victims that are brought in from other states and other countries and they can't articulate to us how they got here, how long they're staying here, where they're gonna lay their head at night. Law enforcement in Baton Rouge uncovering an alleged human trafficking op- Yeah, so there you have it, people. The migrants are trash. Send them back. Former South Dakota mayor charged in triple murder. What? Jay Ostrom, the ex-mayor of Centralville, is being held at a $1 million cash bond, the state attorney general said. Well, what the heck? Former mayor of South Dakota town has been charged with murder after a triple slaying Monday night in the community once oversaw, according to the state's attorney general. Jay Ostrom, 64, is being held in a uh, Minnehaha County Jail on $1 million cash bond and three counts of first-degree murder. Let's see what happened here. There is no further threat to the public, Jackley said after he announced the arrest and the fatal shootings. The names of the victims have not been released because their relatives have not been notified. Ostrom is representing himself in the legal case. He became Centerville's mayor in 2009. City Council accepted his rec resignation in 2011. So why did he resign? Interesting. Uh, the documents do not specify. July 2010, the city's former police chief filed a federal lawsuit against Centerville and Ostrom. The suit, which is ongoing, accuses Ostrom of sexual harassment. So it sounds like that's why he resigned. Ostrom has also made gender-based comments, which were unwelcomed and degrading. Interesting. The suit alleges that he remarked about menstruation, a man's job, and a woman's inability to be successful as a man. Yikes. Not acceptable in today. Uh, the former chief did not receive any disciplinary action or reports against her until she alleged discrimination to the state's Division of Human Rights in October 2009, according to the lawsuit. Centerville, which is about 250 miles southeast of Pierre, the state capital, has a population of fewer than 1,000 people. Well, God rest the souls of the fallen, and we'll see if justice is served with the ex-mayor. Possible association between tattoos and lymphoma revealed. Yikes! So if you are an individual with tattoos, then uh, go ahead and check it out. You could get uh, cancer in your uh, lymph nodes. Our knowledge regarding the long-term health effects of tattoos is currently poor. There's not a lot of research within this area. Now, a research group at Lund University has investigated the association between tattoos and lymphoma. We have identified people diagnosed with lymphoma via population registers. These individuals were then matched with a control group of the same sex and age, but without lymphoma. The study participants answered a questionnaire about lifestyle factors to determine whether they were tattooed or not, says Christiel Nielsen, the researcher at Lund University who held the study, or led it. In total, the entire study included 11,905 people. Of these, 2,938 people had lymphoma when they were between the ages of 20 and 60 years old. Among them, 1,398 people answered the questionnaire while the number of participants in the control group was 4,193. In the group with lymphoma, 21% were tattooed, 289 individuals, while 18% were tattooed in the control group without lymphoma diagnosis, 735 individuals. So how many of them ate orange Doritos? You know what I mean? Like... This seems like a big stretch. After taking into account other relevant factors such as smoking, age, we found that the risk of developing lymphoma was 21% higher among those who were tattooed. It is important to remember that lymphoma is a rare disease and that our results apply at the group level. The results now need to be verified and investigated further in other studies. Such research is ongoing. Yeah, so the hypothesis that Christian Nielsen's research group had before the study was that the size of the tattoo would affect the lymphoma risk. Interesting. They thought that a full body tattoo might be associated with greater risk of cancer compared to small butterfly on the shoulder, for example. Unexpectedly, the area of tattooed body surface turned out not to matter. All right, whatever. Researchers are working on a new mRNA vaccine, this time for bird flu. Looks like they have a space missing there. Editors, beware. Uh, concerns about bird flu continue to grow as a new deadly subtype spreads among wild animals and livestock. But researchers at the University of Pennsylvania have begun work on an experimental novel mRNA vaccine against the virus. And it's already showing promising preclinical trials or results, sorry. Uh, yeah, Moderna, I believe, are in their second clinical trial now for their bird flu vaccine. The H5N1 subtype of avian flu is spread among both poultry and cattle. It's already infected three humans in the U.S., while the health risk to the general public remains low, according to health officials, and there are no sustained signs of human-to-human -human contact. Officials are taking cautious stance after the coronavirus pandemic, of course, and researchers note that mRNA vaccines take less time to develop than traditional vaccines. mRNA technology allows us to be much more agile in developing vaccines. We can start crafting an mRNA vaccine within hours of sequencing a new trial strain with pandemic potential, said Scott Hensley, a professor of microbiology at UPenn's Perlman 
School of Medicine in a statement. During previous influenza pandemics, like the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, vaccines were difficult to manufacture and did not become available until after the initial pandemic waves subsided. The vaccine that researchers are working on could help manage the outbreak of the virus in birds and cattle and prevent human interactions, UPenn said. In addition to the potential human threat, H5N1 represents a danger to both livestock and poultry industries. Egg prices on the rise once again because of the bird flu, jumping 16% from January to late April. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture has offered $98 million to the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to help livestock farmers slow the spread of the virus. To assist in its research, UPenn is consulting with immuno immunologist Dr. Drew Weissman, co-winner of the 2023 Nobel Prize for his work that enabled the development of mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. So there you have it. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Drones to be introduced into Denver police to help respond to 9-11 calls after city defunded the force by millions. Yeah, and they're diverting those funds to migrants. Okay, so uh, the migrants are committing crimes. They want more and they're not happy with what they have. So let's reduce the amount of protection and police security we have to make sure that they're happy and comfortable for illegally entering the country. All right. Well, the law enforcement agency that was recently defunded by millions to pay for migrants is now launching its own drone program along with other Colorado police departments. Robert White, the former chief of the Denver Police Department, originally disagreed with the use of drones in 2013 and 2018, and the agency's only drone was shelved. They had one. Uh, now the department is planning on using $1,000, sorry, a $100,000 grant from the Denver Police Foundation to start the program. Denver Police plan to buy several drones with that money and begin their drone program within 6 to 12 months. We would never simply replace calls for service response by police officers. Phil Gonchak, director of the Department's Strategic Initiatives Bureau, told the Denver Post. So here we have a drone. And I mean, like, what is it going to do? Have a speaker on it and say, please stop doing what you're doing or a human might show up. You know, the DPD would respond to any call for service where someone is physically requesting a police officer on the scene. But if there was a fight at Colfax in Cherokee and we put a drone in the air, there's no fight uh, and nothing causing traffic issues, then we would reroute our police officers to other emergency calls. It's beginning to lift off. The long-term scope of what we're trying to do is drones as first responders, basically having situations on top. Yeah, so whatever. They're going to go and assess the situation. They don't think there's a problem with that. It's not going to replace police. It's going to give some surveillance. It would uh, be well if uh, all of this could be admitted into court, of course. Boom. All right. Before George Floyd, there was a white guy named Tony Timpa. You never heard about who was murdered and his family had to appeal to the Fifth Circuit to even be allowed to sue cops who killed him with a knee on his neck. Oh, and he is the one who called the cops for help. So George Floyd, St. George Floyd over here, uh, was given $28 million settlement that's been approved by the uh, city council. And what the heck's going on here? Let's have a look. All right, Tony Timba died after a police officer kneeled on his neck for 14 minutes court originally denied his family the right to sue. So let's see what they have here. Civil rights attorney says the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which hears appeals from federal courts in Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, is where righteous police misconduct goes to die. But earlier this month, the Fifth Circuit issued a decision in case Tempa versus Dillard that offers renewed hope that people whose constitutional rights have been violated can get justice in court. Tony Timpa called the Dallas police in August 2016 to ask for help. The 32-year-old white college-educated executive was off the medication he usually took for anxiety and schizophrenia and he told the police dispatcher. So someone actually dealing with like a clinically diagnosed um, depression or uh, mental illness. So what happened with this guy? Let's have a look. Last week marked the anniversary of St. George Floyd's death on May 25th, 2020. This career criminal and drug addict attempted to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. When the police arrived to arrest him, the lumbering giant fought back, setting off a series of events that would alter history. Thanks to deceitful Democrats, the propaganda media, and some spineless Republicans, George Floyd was practically canonized because he died while actively breaking the law, carrying drugs, passing fake bills, resisting arrest, and God only knows what else. It was shameful spectacle to witness. Police officers were kneeling to honor a man who once held a loaded gun to a pregnant woman's belly and threatened to kill her while his buddies ransacked and robbed her home. What a guy! And he's a hero. Bend the knee, people. This was the mayor of Minneapolis weeping like an unconsolable widow at Floyd's funeral. Whenever you're having a bad day, just remember that this was some random white dude at George Floyd's funeral. Alright, yeah, whatever. 
By now, you're probably all too familiar with the entire George Floyd saga and how this disgraceful debacle unfolded and ended, including a cops who's rotting in jail for murder, even though no one was actually murdered. Isn't our justice system just grand? But what did they care about Derek Chauvin? He was a pawn in a much bigger game of chess. All right, speaking of colors, George Floyd even had a gold coffin, which is probably going to get dug up and looted if it's real gold, I would imagine. A funeral fit for a king, the king of cell block B, that is. Floyd's family certainly made out like bandits. George turned out to be worth a lot more dead than alive. It's eerily reminiscent of suicide bombers, isn't it? After they die, they're treated like murderers, and their families never have to want for anything again. All right. Well, 27 million can buy a lot of closure, can it? Unfortunately, another family whose loved one was genuinely a victim of police misconduct will never know what that kind of closure feels like. See, Tony Timpa's death didn't matter as much as George Floyd's politicized demise, which ignited division, destruction, hatred, and even more death, just as the Democrats like it. So who is Tony Timpa? He was a college-educated white man who called the police for help because he didn't have his medication and was experiencing a mental health crisis. Before George Floyd, there was a white guy named Tony. Wait, I about that. Okay. So here's a close-up of the images. Yeah, we looked at this already. There he is. Just looks like a regular dude. All right, Tony Tim, a Caucasian man, and George Floyd, a black African-American man, both endured horrifying ordeals while the police custody. Notably, Tony Timba did not resist detention, which sets his case apart from George Floyd's. Nevertheless, just like Floyd, Timba urgently pleaded for his life as an officer's knee was pressed against the body. Tragically, during these encounters, officers display callous indifference while the victims struggled for their lives. Tony Timba's unfortunate fate. August 2016, Tony Timba called 9-11 for help. During a mental health crisis, when police arrived, he was handcuffed and held down with an officer's knee on his back for nearly 14 minutes. Throughout the ordeal, Timber repeatedly informed the officers that he couldn't breathe and feared for his life. Disturbingly, the officer's response was marked by indifference and insensitivity. Tragically, Tony Timber died during the encounter. So there you have it. Basically the exact same situation, except one is, um, you know, a tax-paying individual, seemed like a good dude, you know, and the other one was a criminal. And one is, you know, exalted and... Uh, the other very humbled so yeah what the heck people there you have it it's all orchestrated people it's all fake and they're being they're they're telling you what to think and you're just lapping it up think for yourself people okay do a little bit of research about what's going on in the world today. Don't just say Palestine, yeah, when you're like a gay, homosexual, LGBTQ+, because they hate you, and you're literally a snake eating its own tail, okay? That's where we are at this stage. So, Sigma Tiger signing out. See you Friday, people!